Hello everyone. In the second part of this week's lecture, um, I will go over uh, some of the characteristics of transportation, transportation supply, transportation demand. I'll cover some topics around equilibrium of demand and supply, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, modeling issues. So, what are the characteristics of transport problems usually? Congestion is one of the wide problems in transportation. Delays coming from congestion crashes related to transportation safety, environmental issues. Transport systems are not just about cars. Pedestrians and cyclists are as important. Demand exceeding capacity relating to congestion, aging infrastructure in many developed countries, and underinvestment in transport supply systems. But now if you break the transportation system into demand and supply, actually having look at it from an economic perspective where we have demand and supply what are the characteristics of transport demand transport demand is highly qualitative and differentiated what do i mean by differentiated and qualitative transport demand is differentiated by time of day day of week it's qualitative because of the journey purpose type of cargo for freight transport and importance of speed and frequency Transportation demand is also derived. That means transportation is not an activity by itself. It is only a means to satisfy a need. In order to understand demand, we must understand human needs and activities that are usually distributed over time and space. Transport demand also takes place in a space, relating to the distribution of activities over a space. Transportation demand is also dynamic and time varying. It is concentrated on a few hours of a day, creating peak periods. And now what are some of the characteristics of transport supply? Transportation supply is a service, not a good. It requires fixed assets, infrastructure, and mobile units being vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians. Transportation supply is economically complex. It can be viewed from an economic perspective. So, for example, a very controversial question is what is wrong with providing free road space? Is there anything wrong with providing free road space? Actually, when you look at it from an economic perspective, in a perfect economic market, everything has to have a price. So a good allocation of resources to satisfy needs is only achieved when the marginal costs of the goods or services, in this case, equal their marginal utility. Another characteristic of transport supply is that it has side effects relating to environmental degradation, transportation safety, crashes. But again, another good question here is, do you think road users pay for these external costs and side effects? Actually not. We don't really pay for the environmental issues we create in the transport system. We don't really pay for the pollution or the crashes we may generate in the system. As a matter of fact, underpriced supply is likely to generate an equilibrium between supply and demand that is inherently inefficient. And one of the most important features of transport supply is congestion. But what is congestion? Congestion is usually defined as demand exceeding capacity. So we can actually represent congestion visually through a curve, through a demand curve, where x axis is flow, or the number of users in the system, and y axis is travel time, or travel cost. So as the number of users in the systems or flow increases, the travel time increases. Things get congested in the system. So you can actually look at how an inclusion of an additional vehicle generates the delay to all other users, not just the additional vehicle itself. Another thing you can see in this visual representation is that generated delay is greater that at higher flows than at low flow levels. So you can see on the lower flow range, if you increase the flow by one unit, there is an increase in travel time for all users. But at greater flow range, if you increase the same amount of unit in flow, a larger increase in travel time will be achieved. 
we can actually represent transport system from a demand and supply perspective using some mathematics. So let's go over some of these mathematical representation together. So assume S is a speed or a proxy for level of service or a proxy for supply as a matter of fact. Q represents operating capacity, V represents volumes on the network, and M represents transport management strategies, traffic control, pricing, etc. So what we can do is we can define a speed or supply as a function of Q, V, and M. A speed is dependent on the operating capacity, it depends on volume on the network, and it depends on the type of transport strategies we implement in the system. Operating capacity itself, Q, is dependent on the level of investment over years and also again transport management strategies. So Q is a function of I and M. From the demand side, D represents transport demand, S again represents speed or level of service or representation of supply, and A represents allocation of activities over a space. Remember we said uh, transport demand is spatial. So we can represent mathematically that demand is a function of supply and also the allocation of activities over a space. So if we put all these equations next to each other, we can actually find an equilibrium of supply and demand. So for a fixed system, we find a set of equilibrium points between supply and demand. What do I mean by an equilibrium of supply and demand? So, in an easy way, we can define an equilibrium in, a, in such a way that demand changes as level of service changes, or demand changes as supply changes. The activities itself, the allocation of activities in a space, would probably also change as level of service or supply changes over a space. So demand and supply are closely related. There are two sets of equilibrium points. We have short-term equi uh, equilibriums and we have long-term equilibriums. So one of the tasks in uh, travel demand modeling is to actually forecast and manage the evolution of these equilibrium points over time so that social welfare is maximized. As a result, one of the goals is to develop and implement some management strategies represented by M, if you remember, and some investment plans to do what? To maximize the social welfare. To better understand the concept of equilibrium between supply and demand, perhaps we can use a visual representation. So if you look at the graph on the left, x-axis is flow or traffic. It could be a quantity. y-axis is travel cost or price we can have a demand curve and a supply curve. And where they intersect, that's where the equilibrium happens. So demand curve is when transport, when, when transport cost is low, people travel more. That's how, you, that's how you interpret the demand curve. You can see it has a downward trend that when transport cost gets lower, people travel more. That makes sense. If you look at the supply curve, it has an increasing trend. That means when more people use road, travel cost goes higher. It creates congestion, delays, and everyone will have higher travel times. And as a result, equilibrium point is where demand and supply curves intersect. There's also a concept called elasticity, where it looks at the shift in supply or demand. Imagine we do some change, we make some changes in the transport system and as a result the supply curve shifts to the right and down a little bit. And when the supply curve is changed, you can see that the equilibrium point is also moved. And that's what we can measure with elasticity. Therefore, elasticity is defined as the change in the traffic over the change on the cost of the travel when a change happens in this demand or the supply, when the equilibrium changes. There's also this concept of disequilibrium, where we have a virtuous circle and vicious circle. In a virtuous circle, increase in A causes increase in B, which is not necessarily a bad thing, and it is favorable in most cases. 
where traffic demand increases, as example, fuel tax revenue increases because people use more fuel and then as a result the revenue will increase. And then you go back and invest the revenue in the transport system, then it may induce and a more traffic demand and again the fuel tax revenue will increase. But in a vicious circle, decrease in A causes decrease in B. A good example is the relationship between transit service and transit demand. If transit quality of service goes down, transit demand goes down. When transit demand goes down, again, you have less revenue to invest in transit. So therefore, again, transit service goes down. And then as a result, transit demand goes down. So you get a stuck in a vicious circle. And that's a good example of a disequilibrium. In travel demand modeling context, we have different styles of decision making. We have decisions based on master plans. We have normative decision theory or substantive rationality, which has the travel demand modeling at its core, and that's what we focus in this unit. We have decision making based on behavioral decision theory, assuming decision makers are utility maximizer. Sometimes decision makers are not utility maximizers, as we assume, but simply some satisfiers or regret minimiz minimization concepts related to regret minimization concepts. There's also this group decision making, adaptive decision making, which is based on negotiation and compromise. And perhaps what is common today in transport decision making process is a mixed mode decision making, which you make decision based on master plans, you use some modeling, you use some behavioral theory, you do some group decision making, and you also make decision based on compromise and negotiation between the stakeholders. There are also different approaches to modeling. Where when you want to model, you need to think about the decision-making context. You need to select the scope of the modeling, the spatial coverage of the model, and the level of analysis. You also need to think about what level of accuracy you require. You need to take care of the availability of suitable data. Do you really have all the data needed to create a model? You need to be aware of the state of the art in modeling behavioral richness, mathematical tractability, availability of good solution algorithms. Also, what resources do you have for creating a model? Do you have the enough budget, data, computer, computational power, or technical skills? There are also requirements for data processing, because usually creating a travel demand model from aggregated to disaggregated level requires a lot of data processing. And of course, and obviously, it requires high levels of training and skills among the staff of a company or organization to create a demand model. Now let's have a look at the complexity of model and data, relating it to the error that we may have in the model and data. So there is something called a specification error that comes from the model. Remember, in the problem formulation stage, when you do create a model, you formulate a model and then you estimate the model. When you formulate a model, you may have some specification error. A good example is if X and Y has nonlinear relationship and you assume in your model that they have re linear relationship, that's a specification error. So as the complexity of the model increases, the specification error goes down, as one would expect. On the other hand, on the data side, we have measurement errors. We may have some bias and error in collecting data. Opposite to the model specification error, when you increase the complexity of the data collection, the measurement error may increase. And then when you sum the specification error and measurement error to get the total model and data error, you get an interesting curve where you have a minimum point on the total error curve that is the optimal complexity of the model and data that minimizes the total error. And at last, um, there are some obvious issues in modeling. The role of theory and data. There is a huge gap between theory and practice. What models gets developed in the academic world is different or very sometimes very different from what is being practiced. In practice, still the four-step model, the traditional model that was developed maybe 30, 40 years ago, is the most common way 
However, in the academic world, there's a lot of use of activity-based models, agent-based model, use of machine learning, big data, which hasn't really been welcomed yet in practice. There's also the issue of equifinality or multifinality. There's also this concept of deductive modeling and inductive modeling. Deductive means you build a model first, then test it against observation. Inductive modeling is when you start with the data and infer a law. In the model of specification, you need to think about model structure. Do you want to go simple versus complex, considering correlated variables? You need to also think about functional form of the model. Do you want to go with a linear model or a nonlinear model? How do you want to define or how do you want to specify variables? Which variables do you want to include in your model? There it comes the importance and difficulty of model calibration and validation, which usually requires a lot of data and resources to put in. There is this choice between aggregated and disaggregated modeling. We have cross-section versus time series data. A cross-section data is a snapshot, is, a, is data collected at a snapshot in time. For example, if you collect data at a certain time period, for example, 2015 or 2016, that's called a cross-section data. However, if you observe your transport users over time, over multiple years, for example, that's a time series data. We also have this revealed and stated preference data, which we talk more in the following weeks, which we call RP or SP, revealed preference and stated preference. RP refers to choices that people make in actual world, while a stated preference represents the choices that people only state in a survey that they, that they will make. And as a last slide of this week's lecture, I'd like to briefly go over a little bit deeper into the process of model development, specifically for travel demand modeling. Remember, we covered a general modeling development process, but here we, we do it similarly to that, but with a bit of more demand modeling context. So you start with formulating a problem, you collect the required data you need to form, estimate the model, then you develop an analytical framework, you construct the analytical model, you estimate the coefficients and you calibrate the model. You generate some solutions for testing. You use the developed model to forecast planning variables. And when you're done with this stage, you test the model or basically you validate the model. When you validate the model, you may find some issues in the model. Then you have a feedback loop back to the analytical model or even back to the problem formulation. You may refine the problem, you may re-estimate the model and then you go back and test the model and validate it. And then if you're happy with the performance of the model, you evaluate the solutions and recommend the best solutions you have and at the end you implement the solution in different uh, transport planning uh, cases.